Hi, everyone. Uh, I think we are live and on air, LinkedIn Live. Hello. Uh, got... <laughs> but there's no interaction, so it's just you and me, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're super excited to uh, do some breakdown analysis of the recent uh, Chinese New Year campaigns by a number of brands. Here I'm joined, I'm Kim Leitzes, APAC Managing Director for Launchmetrics, and I'm joined by Michelle Jong, who is from Chat Labs. And so, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself a bit before we get yes. warmed up and started? Hi, okay. Kim. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so, yes, like shit, uh, my name is Misha Chung. I head up sales and marketing at Chat Labs. Uh, Chat Labs is a company that specializes in helping luxury brands succeed in China, predominantly through collecting all of the data uh, from the brand's own social media, like their Xiaohanshu account, their Weibo account, their WeChat account, mixing that with other data sources like the marketplaces. Uh, store sales data, et cetera, and then using that to to really uh, help brands convert their uh, their prospects. So that's really what uh, what we're about. Thank you. I we are super excited to have this conversation because a lot in, at Park Lu and Launch Metrics, we look at I guess the the third party data, right? So what are the conversations that KOLs and influencers have about brands? Um, what is happening on their owned social media channels. And so by kind of putting together the data with Chat Labs, we can have a better understanding of what's happening uh, on social and then also what's happening on the, the traffic and e-commerce side of things. So thanks for joining us today. Super excited to dive in. Um, Great. Just, just so you know, today's chat, we've prepared... Uh, a recap um, and report of five brands. So Gucci, Tiffany, Versace, uh, Tory Burch, and Clarence. So we picked uh, a sampling of fashion luxury beauty brands. And so after today's chat, you can uh, download the report and see for yourself with all the recaps. So um, to, to give a kind of background and context uh, for today's conversation, uh, really need to introduce some key terms here. <laughs> so um, one of the key things we do at Launch Metrics is measure media impact value. So what is MIV? What is media impact value? Um, you'll hear it throughout today's conversation. And it's basically when we benchmarked across voices, so whether it's a KOL, a celebrity, or media post, um, whether it's online, social, or even print, um, we've assigned a monetary value. And so for each engagement or like or how many followers or even the authority and source of that voice impacts the value of that content. So this is a really key thing because by benchmarking all these different types of voices across different platforms, whether it's Douyin, Weibo, Xiaohongshu, et cetera, um, we're really able to understand what's driving the conversation and what's driving impact. And so when you combine that together with um, data from companies like Chat Labs, it actually gives you insights on what's working, okay? So uh, let's kick it off with uh, the, hash, the Gucci Tiger campaign. So they, they really, um, I believe, officially is probably over 40 influencers, but there are easily over 267 spanning both like top tier, mid tier, and um, even micro influencers that uh, not only used a vintage filters um, as well as uh, use filters on Douyin for, for posting as well. Um, and this campaign involved pop-up shops across China where both uh, KOC and top tier uh, creators uh, mentioned the tiger accessories that they had for this capsule collection this year. So, so just curious, Michael, um, do you think bigger is always better from your end for what you see from the chat labs perspective when it's working with KOLs? Um. It, uh, I think the uh, the most famous answer to this one is uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the on the goal. I'm not gonna let you get off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's I think there's uh, there's two answers to this. Like so the brand so the brands typically have like two two goal I, one of two goals for for these kind of campaigns. One is either either it's like a brand led campaign where you're trying to get the brand message and values uh, out to as many people as possible and then the other ones are slightly more commercial ones where you're where you're trying to boost uh, uh, 
obviously demand for a particular product in the market uh, in a particular period. Now for Chinese New Year, in this case with Gucci, I think the, the main aim was, uh, uh, is to create that demand for, for, that, for that product line. I think you'll, we've seen a lot with, uh, with, the, with the campaigns that they, people, they tend to create bespoke products specifically for Chinese New Year, like with tiger patterns, etc. They're not alone in this, uh, which means that you have a certain amount of stock for that product and you have a very short time to actually sell that because you won't be selling it in June, right? Uh, it's not a, a permanent part of the collection. So in, in those cases, I think, yes, uh, bigger is better. Uh, because the, uh, the 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 big celebrities, big KOLs, can get a lot of eyeballs, a lot of attention in a very short space of time to a particular collection, uh, which which uh, which people then will uh, buy and convert. Now, if it's uh, more like a long term play, or if it's a high consideration purchase, like a car or for something like that, in those kind of uh, uh, those kind of scenarios you might uh, look at different sad strategies. But in this case for Gucci, I think, yes, bigger is better. It's actually on the, on the topic of using whether it's celebrity or top tier influencers, even within that, there's different strategies. So we'll see in the cases of Gucci, they, they actually really have the content on their own social channels. And then you have brands like Chanel where when they're working with like brand ambassador and such, it's really on the on the influencer's own account versus on the Chanel official accounts. And then you have the other spectrum of like Bottega Veneta where they just walked away from their own social altogether um, over a year ago. And, mm. um, you know, and there was qu quite a bit of, you know, positive response, I guess, to their our installation on the Great Wall of China. So, so I think, um, I think the incredible thing to note probably in this instance is, yes, there was there was uh, well over four million and media impact value generated from the influencer mentions for for Gucci. But then also, if you looked at their own social accounts, which included the influencer content, well, it, it was actually actually closer to 17 million. So it was interesting to see that contrast. Um, did so I think you mentioned different use cases where, OK, whether it's meant to uh, let's say high purchase intent, et cetera, or build awareness. So what is the value, I guess, from when you, from your perspective, um, you're, you're capturing, you know, offline retail, WeChat, et cetera. What is the value of different tier influencers to, to those different channels? I think uh, from our, our view is that the, the brand succeeding the, they're really outperforming the market in China. They've changed how they look at the conversion funnel. So traditionally, brand what what brands used to, especially uh, from the West, is that it's it's a very traffic based impression and traffic based funnel, right? We're going to buy mm -hmm. a lot of media. We're going to work with influencers. That's going to create impressions. Impressions lead to traffic. Traffic goes to our sales channels and there we convert uh, and that is a very linear uh, one directional path and every time every time that you do another campaign you do the same thing over and over with the same audiences quite quite often uh, and, right. and it costs a lot of money now the brands that are really successful they look at the funnel now not just as a traffic funnel but they're looking at it as a as a customer funnel so customer funnel with that i mean that they they build up a data pool of prospective clients so not just existing clients prospective clients so the you build up a pool of all the followers that you have across all social media and marketplaces etc you combine all that data and then the next step for that is to convert them to your own brand accounts getting them to provide more and more information like phone numbers, et cetera, but also monitoring their behavior, their likes and their dislikes and what kind of products that they're interested in and nurturing those over time through conversion. And then every time that you do another campaign, because you're building up this massive customer prospect pool, you can actually activate your own uh, database as well as use the reach of influencers to grow grow that overall pool. Uh, 
and 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 that's i think uh, one of the one of the key changes in the tactics that people are using and therefore uh, has an as a as an impact on how you design the campaign and what kind of kpis you measure that against and and how you follow up on on that campaign so just to follow through on th that thought so if the brands have a, a pool of prospective customers so existing and prospective um is the idea typically that the that these like celebrity and top tier influencers are bringing new like prospects into that pool or is it also that's as much as for i guess retargeting that that pool of customers uh, i mean probably yeah two yeah first one will be mainly new uh, okay. and then the other element is uh somehow to use them as a method to push them over the edge for conversion right, if you think of uh, on one side is yeah showcasing uh, imagery as part of the campaign with the product and them get interest but on the other hand a lot of, a lot of celebrities are also used for like live streaming on Tmall for example mm -hmm. to do an, a an live streaming event on Tmall that's very much you're going into the existing pool and you're giving them the, the final nudge to to convert on that channel so so, so brands sometimes use they use the same the influencers for different tactics, like you said, it's like with the same people, you can do different things. You can use them to uh, to 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 convert or to help uh, reach their audience to grow your own brand pool, which you then nurture into conversion. Um, and I know at Chat Labs, you have a number of luxury clients, um, you know, that span from jewelry and watches and, and fashion, etc. Uh, what uh, what KOLs, you know, are your clients excited about these days? Any uh, up and coming that come to mind? Well, uh, I, I think uh, the the Olympics were they they're, they've been very interesting, right? They've generated some uh, some new KOLs, uh, almost or top tier celebrity influencers. Eileen Gu was one that everybody was a, a, excited about, or Gu Eileen, as they should say in, in China. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'm I'm a fan. I want to be her. I mean, how are you? How can you be so well, good at what you do as well as just being uh, that, that that level of symbol? But uh, well, yeah, we were we were looking at um, her performance, right? Because she's she's uh, been at least endorsing at least over twenty three brands. Yeah, um, in a very short space of time. Yeah. So even for for Tiffany, it was. Last month, she probably generated, uh, you know, over three and a half million MIV um, for Louis Vuitton. I, I, last month was also like close to four million um, from those posts. And I think what's incredible is like her top performing posts, even though she maybe has less, maybe five million followers in Weibo, but her top posts will have like two million, you know, comments and engagement. So an incredible amount of, uh, of uh, just, yeah, community be there behind her. Be don't you think the, the interesting bit about her is as well is that she has influence both in China and outside China, which is quite unique for like Chinese influencers, right? Normally, uh, where obviously you have big, big Hollywood celebrities and stuff like that. But I think she carries a lot of in influence both outside and inside China. Uh, and I think, I don't know, uh, I actually didn't look at what was the prior to the, the Olympics, but maybe you guys have some, seen some trends on that. It's like, what was there? Because she didn't really have that that much on social accounts in China domestically, mm -hmm. like her we her WeChat account or her Weibo account or something, but she had a massive influencer uh, or, or Instagram following already. Have you seen like her embracing those channels when she decided to compete for China? Right. And, yeah, actually, we're gonna we're we're gonna have some detailed analysis of it coming up, so I'm excited Ooh. to share that at some point. Yeah, so it'll be interesting because actually, previously, when uh, for some of you know, I'm I'm the founder of Park Blue, which sold to Launchmetrics over a year ago. So, the past decade, I've only looked at China data, and the coolest thing about Launchmetrics, we can actually look at the global data. <laughs> so it's 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 a pretty um, unique perspective when you try to compare apples to apples because this is one of the it's a common. Um, a strategic question that a lot of global brands have, where the China marketing teams feel strongly that, you know, uh, I would say 
low, you know, China native celebrities carry a lot more weight than even um, Hollywood or other celebrities. Um, and so when you kind of break down that analysis, it even mm -hmm. even comparing like Korean um, and, you know, brand ambassadors versus Chinese ambassadors, there's, there's quite a bit of Delta. So this is, it's, it's actually hard to, to really get your head around the numbers, both for the China social and Western on, on the same page. So yeah, it's, um, very unique. Yeah. Um, and I guess kind of looking at some of the other brands that we, we kind of looked at, there was uh, Gucci and Clarins had a pretty significant part of their MIV, their media impact value coming from like mid tier influencers. Um, uh, across like the different channels, um, why, you know, is there, is there something brands should be considering in order to, I guess, maximize their impact and ROI from their campaigns? Um, what we what we tend to see from our side of the data is like when they, when people use the, the top tier, uh, uh, celebrities, etc. It's usually for very few posts for a short period of time, and it just generates these massive peaks, right? You like, you go literally from ah, oh, today you had one million visitors to your WeChat account, and the next day you have fifty-five million, and then you have one million <laughs> again, right? So it's like literally just gigantic spikes uh, when people only use uh, uh, celebrities. Um, from a business operational perspective, that's mm. actually a nightmare. Like it's a marketer's dream to reach fi 55 million people on, on, the, <clears throat> on the same day. Uh, it's an yeah. e-commerce operations guy's nightmare to have all his orders for, for his e-commerce on, on the same day, right? <laughs> uh, it it creates logistical nightmare, yeah. it creates customer service nightmare, uh, et cetera. It's a so good great problem to have. Hmm? <laughs> it's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, 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 it'd be like the same with like, I always like to compare it to like physical stores. So I say you have a physical store and over the course of a month, you have 10,000 people visit it, you, your store. Ideally, you want like, uh, like, like 300 people a day or whatever uh, to go to your store. Not all 10,000 on, on sat Saturday at 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. and then the rest of the month, nothing. Uh, so, and that's, that's really the same when you look at the influencer strategy, how do you have sort of a consistent demand, uh, uh across your entire estate and working with the, uh, so, so on one side you have the boosts of the big celebrities, but on the other side to have sort of a sustainable level of traffic to your physical channels, as well as your digital channels, it's much more cost effective to work with a large pool of, uh, of KOCs so with smaller mm -hmm. audiences that continuously drive the conversation in social, that continuously drive demand and traffic to your, to, uh, to your stores and to your digital presence. So I think both are, both are very important. If you do one but not the other, I don't, I don't, it doesn't tend to work very well. And it, it has been challenged. I mean, the, I guess the rules and the algorithm um, that drives the strategy for, say, KOC changes well, right? You know, Shah Hong mm -hmm. went through a period where they were eliminating um, what they considered uh, sponsored KOC content, right? They, they really wanted to make sure that the community was organic. Um, so for a lot of brands, I guess for, for, for big brands, KOC happens organically. Right. Yeah. Um, but for, I guess, mid sized or even up and coming brands, KOC, to get that contrived versus earned mix mm. um, is harder to scale. And I think that's definitely something where, of course, with beauty brands, yes, there's massive product seeding. Um, you know, there's like offline activations to, to get that content created. Um, and it, it certainly comes down to which. I guess channels or which platforms these brands want to invest in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so how important is it that a campaign be, you know, ubiquitous and omnipresent? And because in many cases, particularly with with KOL campaigns, it, it does tend to focus on maybe two platforms at times. Um, 
how, how does that work in the context of the whole customer funnel and, and you know, this, this how tapping into that pool that these brands are prospecting from? Uh, it's, yeah, it's interesting. So I think it is, it is very Im important to be omnipresent. I think it's probably more important to newer brands, like the lower brand recognition that you have actually the bigger presence you need across the different channels it might sound a bit counterintuitive, but it's, it, people tend to consumers tend to look for validation of their purchase intent before, before committing mm -hmm. to a purchase. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we sometimes, uh, and me as well as when I was still marketing for like the beers, uh, which is a previous role of mine, you know, you sometimes make the mistakes where you think, uh, I have this traffic on this social media, this traffic on this social media, this traffic on Tmall, and they're all different. And I, I you add them all up. In fact, especially in China, it's all the same people, <laughs> but they, mm. they, but they channel, they, they check all the different channels. First, they, they check the different channels for different things. So they'll, they might check one channel to see if the product is hot or not, <laughs> if they, if they, if it, if it's popular, uh, they will check on other channels on the, on the own channels, like it's, it's authenticity. Uh, of the of the brand and the product and its heritage and stuff like that, and they might they might check other channels again to see where they if they want to buy, where they get the where they want to, where they can get the best deal, like sign up to everything to see what kind of co coupons or invitations or discount set people get or free gifts, uh, and uh, and the Chinese consumer is actually super clever when it comes to that. They will. They will sign up to everything. Uh, they will even contact internationally to see if they can get a better deal. The higher the price point, the, the more people love to negotiate and find the perfect deal. It's all like almost a sport, even for the people that don't that, uh, don't actually need the, the, to have that big di 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 discount. Uh, they'll go and they'll go everywhere to uh, one validate their. Uh, uh, they're thinking about what they want to do, whether or not they like the brand and the product. But then secondly, also to check what's available where and everywhere. Uh, and all of that has, a, has an impact. Um, and the tricky thing for brands is actually to be to be consistent everywhere uh, and have a consistent answer and consistent offering across all of those so that, uh, yeah, you don't look look silly when talking to the customer. Yeah, I had I had a friend go through that process for a, a premium stroller. Right? Yeah, um, probably initially saw it on WeChat moments, or I, I think even a, a KOL had posted with it. Then proceeded to ask in a WeChat group, <laughs> moms, um, yeah. and looked on Shopify which, which colorways and which model, and you know when the next one would be coming out. And then after all the research on both the pricing on Tmall, then you know, then somehow did the math that it might be easier to order and ship it from Europe. <laughs> so, I mean, so yeah, it was quite a, it was exactly. a quite process to figure that out. And that, we had, the, I had this all the time. People would like, they'd be in, in, in Shanghai, in the store, looking at a particular product. And then the, uh, one of the, one person in the couple would actually at that same time be WeChatting the sales associates in Harrods in London that they visited that month to see if they could also order that same product, ship it then tax free out of the UK and earn points on the Har Harrods store using their uh, credit card where they also earn points and then ship it and then see if that deal was better than they could physically get in the store yeah. in front of them. It's just, uh, it, <laughs> it happens a lot. And so, so given that you basically said brands should be everywhere, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how, how, how important is it? Okay, I'm going to ask the question differently. Um, so a lot of brands measure their campaigns, right? Mm. But where do you think the opportunity is for better measurements, right? Um, I think the best channel for attribution and measurement is still by far WeChat. And the okay. reason for that is because it's an open platform. Brands can get the data that comes from WeChat. 
I can get your WeChat internal ID. I can see your behavior. I can see uh, what you click on, what you don't click on. I can get all the data from the mini programs. Uh, if you go, for, go into a store and you connect to a sales associate, I can see that that's the same person because it's WeChat ID. When you pay somewhere with WeChat Pay, I can again tie that to the same ID. So all of that is tied to the same identifier. Whereas uh, marketplaces and some of the uh, other social media platforms, they're far less open, predominantly because their business model is advertising. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to give the uh, brands access to all of the data so that they can themselves reach out to them because then they lose out on the advertising revenue, Tim, Timor being notorious for that. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, Tencent we, with WeChat, they actually only like, I think about like 15% of their revenue is ad advertising as opposed to like Meta where you have 98.3% of all their revenue is advertising, uh, which is why Tencent actually uh, wants to create an open platform, which is great for users and great for brands, but doesn't try and put, hoard all of the consumer data uh, and all of the insights so that they that you can only get access to that by paying for it uh, through advertising. So because if you do a campaign on, um, on say, like a Douyin or a Tmall or whatever, you have to pay uh, pay them to get a specific audience that is specific interested in a specific thing that looked at this kind of content that's in the market for jewelry or whatever it is that you're selling mm. uh, whereas with wechat you can do all you can get all that data yourself and then do all yeah. of that uh, segmentation yourself with all of the data and then you can send them a wechat message or a conversation directly from a sales associate and it's free there is no advertising cost there uh, so, so i always tell people yeah drive people from weibo from Douyin, from tmall drive them to wechat collect the data there and then nurture and convert on your own channels because it saves you a lot of money and reduce your overall cost of acquisition are most brands tracking the, the the attribution by for KOL campaigns at a KOL level. Um, yeah. Through well, are, are most brands it, doing it? No. Can they do it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mo and, most, why, and so why aren't they? I'm just, I, you know, I'm just. <laughs> well, that's a good question, Kim. Uh, um, why aren't they? I don't know. Like it's 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 sim the tracking isn't actually that hard. Uh, and, and once once we've worked with the brands to to actually showcase how they can measure, then they want to do it. But pri previously, they haven't thought about those kind of methods. For example, the, the, the simplest way in China to measure a an omni-channel or cross-channel campaign is through the QR codes, right? Uh, right. The QR code... So, in olden days, you use the same QR code everywhere, and that is just a link that goes somewhere to WeChat or something. But nowadays, most uh, the clever way to do it is you can actually embed the meta information in the QR code themselves. And you can have different QR codes across different channels for different, uh, for different cases. So if you have a campaign with an influencer that shares a QR code that people scan, you can add, and that generates traffic, you can see the you can attribute the traffic to that particular post. Uh, but equally, if I then put a QR code on a billboard in the Shanghai in, uh, terminal in, uh, in the airport and people scan that, that is actually, uh, I can track oh, that person at that particular day, at that particular time was in an airport in Shanghai. They're an international traveler. Uh, and they are, and they were interested in the brand because of this particular campaign, because we knew what billboard was up there at that particular time. So it's it's completely uh, doable. People just need to conceive at the start that how they want to measure these things, and then actually plan for that in the execution. And that sometimes I think is missed. People get get lost in the creative and which influencer to use and what channel to use. And then they go live and then they're like, oh, we forgot to create like the trackable links or trackable QR codes. 
So all we can see is uh, we had we had a spike of traffic there, but we don't actually know 100% where it came from. <laughs> but we think it was because just, of just, just one follow-up question on that, because I know we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm still right. brewing on this in my head. So, so for example, let, let's say um, a sales associate gets a WeChat message from, you know, a, a prospective customer or VIP customer who saw this post with Eileen Gu, you know, uh, wearing something for mm. Tiffany. So from a, from a data analysis perspective, the brands can actually understand like, okay, actually of all our sales associate conversations, we actually had specific um, celebrities or influencers that, that were... Yeah driving conversation is that possible yeah all the luxury uh brands a lot of luxury brands that we work with nowadays use wecom so we chat work for mm -hmm. uh, conversations uh for, for, for with with staff for example in the stores yep. and all of that we track so we can see every single conversation that any sales associate has with any prospect or existing clients across the whole country uh we can even transcribe the voice notes uh, into text, so we and we can analyze all of the conversational data. Uh, but probably a more simpler way is that during the the sign up, the customer sign up, when they connect to the sales associate, they can just tag them uh, as part of the conversation. Oh, they came through this campaign, or they were interested in that, or because of course quite often, especially with luxury, uh, uh, the, the sales cycle isn't you walk in, you get the product, and you walk out. It's a more considered process. There's more research involved in jewelry and watches. People might come three, four times into the store before they make their final purchase decision. And they, then they look at all the different channels everywhere, uh, right? So it's important to log the, the, the interest and where people came from uh, so that uh, the next person that uh, deals with that customer can seamlessly pick up. Uh, from the previous conversation, regardless of if they were the people on duty that day in the stores or not. Uh, so yeah, we can, and it is super useful from an attribution, but also just from an experience perspective, right? It's 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 not nice to every time that you go into the store to have to explain what you what you're there to do and who you are and what you're interested in. It's much nicer if if they just go, "Hi Kim, nice to see you again." I, I heard from my colleagues you're interested in such and such. We we it's coming back in stock next week or blah blah, blah. and that's what we're really trying to achieve. Great that's experience. That's really interesting. Yeah. Wow. Um, I learned so much more. I learned about Chinese New Year campaigns and <laughs> the intricacies of WeCom and WeChat today. Um, well, uh, we are we've kind of run over time, and I. Are we supposed to take questions? I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? No questions. <laughs> um, anyways, we're out of time. So if you do have questions, um, uh, feel free to add uh, Michelle and I on LinkedIn. If you aren't, haven't already, um, uh, send us a message or add us on WeChat. And um, we will be uh, distributing the link for the rep uh, report that was covered earlier in today in today's conversation. I'm really excited and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kim. Thank you everyone for listening. See you around. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.